Good afternoon. Welcome to the Fast Data Theatre. We are going to talk uh, a little bit today about how we can simplify data streaming transforms using WebAssembly. Uh, we will start off uh, by just having a quick look at what data streaming means. If you're not familiar with data streaming, we will do a very quick overview of that. Uh, we're going to look at what doing transformations looks like and how uh, WebAssembly can help. We're then going to go through uh, how to use and deploy that, and we're going to have time for a quick demo as well. So that's the plan. So data streaming, very simply as a 101, is about moving data in real time or near real time from one place to another. And so in its very simplest form, we've got data being produced by some sort of, uh, some sort of data producer. Uh, it could be market data, it could be telemetry, it could be social, it could be any, any type of data you've got. It's being produced to some sort of broker. Uh, and in this case, we've got Kafka, Red Panda uh, acting as that broker. And then one or more consumers consuming that data from that broker. That is data streaming in its very simplest form. And how do we scale that? Well, uh, with, with Kafka and Red Panda, we can cluster those brokers. And we can have topics that are spread across the cluster of brokers, uh, sharded as partitions. And we can, we can basically scale that out as far as we need to go. And so the more partitions we have, the further we can scale that topic. And we can have multiple producers and multiple consumers uh, interacting with that environment. That is data streaming at its very simplest form. Uh, as an example of this, uh, the example we've got today is some data that's being uh, scraped from some sort of sensor. Uh, maybe a piece of JavaScript or Python is scraping that data, producing that into our, into our topic on our broker. And then in this particular case, we've got Kafka Connect is consuming that data from the broker and writing it out into some sort of NoSQL database. And that NoSQL database could equally be a dashboard somewhere, or it could be some analytic, or it could be something else that's, uh, that's going on. So very simple, very scalable, very performant. But what we've done here is we've actually decoupled our source system with our destination. Uh, we, sorry, we, it's not decoupled. Uh, so whatever format is being produced from that source system is now what we're expecting at the far end. And so the question that comes up time and time again is, how can we how can we have some sort of form of intermediate schema? How can we decouple that source and that sync? And so what you end up doing is you end up writing a little piece of code that's going to consume from our input topic, do some form of transformation. Uh, it might be a, a format change. It might be a schema change. It might be uh, maybe validation or filtering or something like that. And then we're going to write it back into an output topic. Okay, and, and in this example here, we've now got some Flink code that's coming along and it's going to do some, uh, some analytics on that and publish it onto some sort of dashboard. Downsides of this approach is we're introducing latency into the system. That's that little piece of code that's consuming and producing adds latency. Um, also, potentially, depending on where you host it, you've got network costs coming in there as well. So that's always something to be aware of. You've then got a whole load of operational considerations. So what are we going to write in? Um, where are we going to host it? How are we going to schedule it? How are we going to make sure it's actually running? How are we going to monitor and maintain it? What if we need to patch it? Do we need to make sure that all the dependencies, the image that it's running, all of those considerations now actually makes that very simple, I want to get one thing from one format into another, into something that's actually a bit of an operational headache. Um, so that's fine. Maybe, OK, we're doing this for one example. We've got one piece of code. We've got to worry about that. But in a, con in a typical environment, you might have dozens of these, or maybe hundreds of these. And all of a sudden, that becomes quite a big problem. We've got all these little, um, almost you know, micro consumer producers that we've got to worry about, and we've got to manage and maintain uh, the whole way along. And so that's why in Red Panda, uh, sorry, this is what we call data ping pong. So data ping pong, this, this bringing data backwards and forwards between the broker in order to do kind of small pieces of transformation. And so that's why in Red Panda, we came up with the idea of being able to do stateless transformations within the broker. So now all of that stuff that we had to worry about of where we're going to host this code, how's, how are we going to run it, how are we going to maintain it, how are we going to scale it, we're now doing that within the broker. We're avoiding this data ping pong. Um, and you know, all of that management overhead has now gone away. We've got it in the broker. We can scale that out as well. As we add brokers, as we add partitions, uh, those transformations are co-hosted. And so we don't need to worry about how we operationalize that. And WebAssembly is the, is the language that we can use to do this. Um, this gives us massive power and flexibility. So 
what is WebAssembly? Some of you will have heard about WebAssembly. Some of you won't have. Some of you know probably everything there is to know about it. We're going to do a quick overview of WebAssembly. So WebAssembly, in its very simplest form, is a stack-based uh, virtual machine environment for running code. It was designed to run on the web in your browser uh, as a very simplistic uh, base instruction set that you can then compile other languages down to run. So it's, it's an assembly code of sorts that would run uh, perhaps in a browser or some sort of, uh, some sort of other system. Um, and it came about kind of as the, as the evolution of JavaScript in the browser. Um, in about, about 10 years ago, Mozilla, uh, Mozilla came up with ASM.js, assembly JavaScript, which assem essentially is how is running an assembly language in JavaScript in your browser. And then the evolution of that, um, it came out of the W3C, I believe, is, is WebAssembly. And so this idea that you can actually run assembly code natively within some sort of execution engine. Um, and the power of this thing is amazing. So the fact that you have this really low-level instruction set uh, that you can compile other languages into, um, take a few examples that I've got on here, AutoCAD and Photoshop, two kind of big heavyweight legacy C, C++ applications that have been running on desktops for years and years and years. The publishers of these code bases have managed to actually recompile them to run in WebAssembly in a browser. Okay, and if you think, if you try to do that, you know, I'm going to write, I'm going to rewrite Photoshop in JavaScript. I mean, that's going to take decades, right? Um, they've managed to just recompile it and run it in a browser. That is the power of WebAssembly. And, and if you sit there thinking, oh, I've kind of heard this idea of running code in a browser before, um, the big power of WebAssembly, because it is this low-level instruction set, means you can compile pretty much any other programming language you can think of to run in WebAssembly. And so there are languages at various states. I think it's around 40 languages that you can compile to run in WebAssembly today. Um, C and C++ compile very easily because you've got mature compilers that you can then just write down to assembly code. Um, JavaScript, Go, all of those. Also, interpreted languages. So things like, uh, things like Python or Java, you can't compile them to run in WebAssembly, but you can compile the interpreter to run in WebAssembly. So you can now, if you want to write some Python code to run in WebAssembly, when you build that, essentially you're going to deploy Python with the code, run that then in WebAssembly. And you don't need to then worry about where I'm running this code. Does it have Python 3.8 or 3.9 or whatever the next version of Python is? Uh, has it got the right dependencies? Is it running on ARM or is it running on x86? You don't need to worry about any of that. You're deploying to the bytecode that is WebAssembly, and all of that is abstracted away from you. So you have a, uh, a dis uh, an architecture-less deployment target for you to work to. It's designed to be efficient. This really simple, it's a stack-based virtual machine, so it's very simple at its core. And therefore, it can be really optimized. And so the engines that run this, one of them is the V8 engine that runs in Chrome, is the same thing that runs Node.js. So it is designed like it has had years and years of optimization, and you're running this as low-level instructions. So it runs super efficiently. It is designed to be versionless and backwards compatible, uh, and it's based on open standards. So you don't have, if you think of the early days of JavaScript, you don't have this, oh, is it going to work in this browser? Is it going to work in this browser? No, it, it is a simple instruction set, and therefore it is open. Um, it's also designed to be safe by default. So we're not starting off open and then trying to, knock, you know, trying to lock things down. It starts off locked down in a sandbox. And as you deploy an engine, you can choose to open things up. WASI, WASI, depending on where you come from, basically this is POSIX for, for WebAssembly, for WASM. Um, so that gives you an, an operating environment within which to run your code. So you get things like clocks and random and file system and network and, and all the good things that you, would, you, know, you love and need when you're running in a container, you get that in WebAssembly as well. So this is kind of the latest um, iteration in WebAssembly. And the power of this um, is such that the, the people that wrote Docker uh, back in sort of 2008 said that if Wasm and Wasi had existed then, they wouldn't have bothered writing Docker. That is how seriously kind of the industry is taking WebAssembly. Um, and I, I kind of look at it a bit like this, in that we started off originally with, uh, with mainframes, where you would go to a mainframe and you would rent some time on a mainframe. Um, and then we all got kind of commodity servers, and that was, that was kind of cool. Then we had virtualization with hypervisors, but you still had to be aware of the underlying platform that you're running underneath. 
Then we've had containers coming along, and WebAssembly is very much the, the next evolution of that, uh, of, of where we host things. And it's seen as kind of the, the open way of doing serverless computing. Right now, the problem with serverless is you're always locked into whatever vendor. Everybody's serverless is different. Well, if you're running WebAssembly, actually, you've got a standards compliant way of doing serverless. Um, and it's not just the browser. We've talked a lot about the browser and running WebAssembly in the browser. But you're now seeing this pop up in the cloud as well. And so people like Cloudflare and Envoy and Nginx recently have launched plugin frameworks where you can write WebAssembly and then run them as policies in, uh, you know, in your software as a service type environments. And so this is becoming the future of how you do kind of pluggable based uh, policies or, or filters or whatever in cloud-based environments. So it's not just uh, it's not just in browsers. This is happening on the, on the server as well. And so we're talking about data streaming, and no conversation about data streaming is complete if we don't talk about Red Panda. And so what is Red Panda? Red Panda is a fairly new company, a uh, little over four years old, backed by Google Ventures and Lightspeed. And Red Panda is very much a re-implementation of the Kafka protocol. So we've taken Apache Kafka, thrown it away, um, started with the API and rewritten every single bit from the ground up in C and C, well, in C++. And the reasons we do that is it's designed to be simple, it's designed to be powerful, it's designed to run on modern hardware that has multi-core CPUs and has fast NVMe disks, um, and it's designed to be reliable. So it's not based on the in-sync replica mechanism, it's based on Raft, which is a mathematically proven algorithm for ensuring integrity of your data stores. Um, this idea of basing it on the Kafka API means that whatever you've got that currently works with Kafka is going to work with Red Panda today. So whether that's Apache Flink, or whether it's uh, KSQL DB, or maybe it's Kafka Connect, or Java, or Go, or whatever you've got that's currently working with Kafka, that will work with Red Panda as well. You don't need to make any code changes whatsoever. Um, it also has tiered storage built in, so you can back your topics with S3 or ADLS, meaning you don't need to size your Kafka cluster the way that you would have done previously based on expensive disks. We're now basing it based on the performance. And the performance of Red Panda is an order of magnitude quicker than Apache Kafka because we don't have Java. We don't have garbage collection. We don't have Zookeeper. We don't have all of those things that makes Kafka hard to, to run and manage. And so why use WebAssembly for streaming? Well. We can use any language. So we want to do these stateless data transforms within the broker. We can do that straight off in any language. So it's not that because we're running in the Java virtual machine, we would have to use some flavor of Java or JavaScript or something like that. A anything you can write. So any of your developers that you've got working for you, um, or any, code, you know, any language, pick, pick your favorite language, you can compile that into WebAssembly and then run that as a filter in your Red Panda broker. Um, we get, because of this sandbox environment, strict uh, limits in, in every dimension. So CPU, memory, we can control that. And WASI gives us the POSIX environment as well. Um, so you know, you, we wouldn't dream of running a Docker container inside Red Panda. I think that would be fairly scary stuff. But with, with WASM, we can actually control the execution of that. Um, there's a thing called gas metering, uh, which counts basically in the number of instructions we're having per operation, and we can control that. Uh, it's called gas metering. I've checked to see if there is a British term for it. Um, apparently, there isn't, so it's called gas metering. Um, we, can, we can stop um, other threads aborting the runtime as well. And we can control memory and table sizes and that sort of thing. Um, OK, I'm going to work through now a quick example of how we would build a transform. And this is super simple. As I said before, Red Panda is designed to be simple. Uh, it's designed to be easy to use. And you'll see kind of as we do this how that looks. Um, OK, so. I must point out, all of this is in tech preview right now. We will be moving into beta later in the year and hopefully to GA shortly after that. Um, but right now, this is tech preview. So please don't run this in production today. If you want to, come and chat with me at the stand afterwards and we can have a conversation. But yeah, there's my, uh, there's my disclaimer there. Um, this QR code takes you straight to our doc. So all of what we've got here is in the documentation. So if you want to scan that, please do. First of all, we download the sandbox. So we're going to curl that, download that, and that gives us the RPK command. RPK is the red, uh, the red panda command line 
uh, utility that we use. And it, again, is simple. It doesn't have a million different flags that all of them are different depending on whether you're listing topics or browsing anything else. It's very simple. Um, and then we want to start Red Panda. Um, we're going to run RPK container start. It is that easy to get Red Panda up and running. We're not worrying about Zookeeper or any of that, uh, any of that nonsense. We're up and running RPK container start. And I want to create two, po two topics. So RPK topic create, demo one, demo two. My topics are created. To build the transformation, again, it continues on a theme. So RPK transform init. Uh, that's going to build us uh, our structure, our, our skeleton code that we're going to need. And the example we've got here is in Go. It's actually in tiny Go. Um, WASM or WASI support is coming in Go 121. I think 121 is already out. Um, but, but right now, we're using tiny Go for this. Tiny Go actually runs a little bit faster because it, of the way it's compiled, which is kind of neat. Um, so the one we're looking at here is our transform.go. And the code here, hopefully you can see this, um, is very, very simple. This is just an, an example transformation that is going to take a record and then spew it back out again the other side. So it's the identity transform. It's the, the plus zero or whatever. And so we've got a main method here. Um, I'll use the, the pointer so that we can see that. The main method here is any setup that we need to do. And it's registering the callback to my transform. Very simple. Um, you, can, you can set global variables as well if you want to. But we don't maintain, we can't guarantee any maintenance of state in between invocations of this. Um, and then this transform, we're going to take an event called E and then write it out as a slice of records uh, in here. So very simple. Everything that comes in on this is going to be written back out the other side. That is the simplest transform, but there's not a lot of code we've had to write to make this happen. Um, and then if we, to actually deploy it, again, similar thing, RPK transform build. That's going to take a few seconds to build that. And then we deploy it. And I'm going to tell it what the input topic and the output topic is. Um, this is not the demo. This is, just, uh, this is just a slide, as you can tell. But what I'm doing here is I'm writing two records, uh, foo and bar, to my RPK topic produce demo one. And then when I'm consuming from demo two, you can see that foo and bar are being written out the other side. So super simple example. But this is what it looks like to do uh, a very simple uh, producer consumer using WebAssembly. A slightly more complicated example here. Um, this is an example that is going to be validating uh, our JSON. So we've got JSON coming into a topic, but you know, stuff happens on the wire. You could end up with invalid JSON. And quite a common problem in, in Kafka environments is this idea of poison messages. You get a message that that can't be processed, and then everything gets stuck behind it. And it's like, what do you do with that record? And so what we're doing here is we're going to take, um, take our input record here, E. We're going to uh, check or run it through json.valid. Uh, if it is valid, then we're going to append it to our output. And if it's not, then we're not going to append it. And so anything that's not valid JSON for whatever reason, um, we're going to be filtering out. Again, very, very simple. Um, OK. We're going to go for a live demo. Um, let's see how this goes. So we have uh, Major Tim Peak here tomorrow giving the, uh, giving the keynote to close the session. So I wanted to see if we could work out where is Major Tim Peak. Turns out he's not in space, um, which is kind of disappointing. I don't have a tracker on him, but we're going to track the International Space Station and work out where it is right now. So we're going to have a piece of code that's going to be uh, connecting to an API, consuming uh, the location data off the International Space Station. We're going to write that in the format that it comes off the wire in JSON into Red Panda. We're then going to use a stateless transform to convert that into Avro. And then we're going to consume that using Red Panda console. Um, I also found out, um, and I didn't know this, there's loads and loads of telemetry you can get off the space station. You can work out what the voltage of all the different bits are and what it's your and pitch and uh, how much clean water and wastewater they have, if that's really what you want to find out. Um, so what we can do later on is we can take this simple Avro schema we've got, and with, uh, with schema evolution, we can start adding fields in as we connect up to different data sources. So this idea of decoupling our source and our sync uh, means that we can, we can build this up later on as we go. Um, OK, right. So uh, let's start over here. We will start off by bringing uh, Red Panda up. I've got this in a Docker Compose. So bring that up, and that should be up and running. And then hopefully, if I go back to my browser, 
Red Panda Console here is, uh, is going. And so Red Panda Console is the web-based UI that we can use to interact with a Red Panda cluster. And so this is a brand new uh, Red Panda cluster we've got going here. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing particularly interesting in it. Um, first thing is I want my Avro schema. So I'm going to just post that in using the API uh, on here. And so that's posted in. And so if I refresh this, make that a little bit bigger. So I now have my schema in the schema registry. And uh, the important thing here is we've got schema ID 1. Obviously, it's not always going to be it's not always going to be schema ID 1. In a production environment, it's going to have a different number. But we're going to need that for, for starting our data transform later on. Uh, OK, let's go and create our topics. So uh, topic create, we saw that before, topic create. Uh, so I can create my JSON topic just using RPK. RPK topic create, ISS JSON. Um, I can also do that using Red Panda Console if I wanted to. So I can go to topics in here, and I can create a topic. Uh, ISS Avro. Uh, I can set any uh, any policies that I want to. Maybe I want to have a slightly longer uh, longer retention on that if I wanted. So I could uh, set that to have maybe uh, 30 days, not 30 days retention if I want to do that. And so there we go. I've created another topic. So I've now got my two topics: uh, my input topic and my output topic. Uh, I'm not going to initialize the code um, because I've already written the code for you to make this uh, a little bit easier. And so my method that I've got going on here, um, this is a little bit more complicated than the example that we went through before. So I'll kind of just walk through what this is doing. First up in our main method, we're going to connect to the schema registry and download the schema. And then as the schema evolves, uh, we will always be getting the latest version of the schema. So I need my environment variable, which is schema ID. Uh, I'm going to get that get the schema out of there, and build a codec using GoAvro. Um, once I've got that, I'm going to store the codec and the schema ID in a uh, global variable uh, here. So that, that global variable will persist between runs, but if it ever gets reinitialized, that main method will be run, and I will go and get the schema ID uh, again. I've then registered the callback of this function here to Avro. Um, and so this is where we're going we're gonna to pass the JSON convert it into our Avro schema, and then hopefully write the record out. So first up, parsing the record. Uh, I'm using the JSON library in Go to unmarshal that into a struct, and then just writing this as an output map. This is all sim super simple code. Um, you could do much more complex things, but for, for the benefits uh, for this demo, this, is, uh, this will do. Once we've got that output map, this comes back to here. I'm then doing a little bit where in order for us to associate the binary Avro with the schema, I need to put in uh, what's called a magic, uh, a magic header. This is part of, of how we interact kind of with Avro and, and Kafka doing this. So we start off with, uh, with the zero byte, and then we have four bytes which represent the schema ID. So that schema ID of one, we're going to encode in here, uh, and that's going to be our header. And then very simply, I'm taking that, um, that map that I had and using binary from native to generate my Avro binary. That's done. I then write this out to a record, and this then gets uh, written out as the return from my function. So all in all, uh, 100 lines of code um, to actually do a little bit of schema translation and interaction with the schema registry. And we could, we could, you know, we could make this a little bit simpler if we wanted to, but, but this is pretty, pretty easy to do. OK, right. We are going to uh, build the transform, RPK transform build. Always takes a little bit longer if you've got people watching you. Um, so I could do a dance. It should be around about 10 seconds. Once that's done, uh, it'll say, next thing you need to do is RPK transform deploy, which is what we'll do there. With this one, uh, if you can see at the bottom, we're passing in this environment variable, this schema ID of 1. So that's the, that's the bit that's coupling us to our environment. So we need that schema ID of 1. The input topic and the output topic is there. And that deploy is successful. If you want to look what the, um, the deployed code looks like, we can Look at that. Essentially, it gets, it's a binary file, so kind of none of us hopefully read binary. But if you write this back out as assembly language, this is kind of what it's been compiled down to, which you know, I'm sure is kind of interesting. Um, we can also, if we go back to Red Panda Console, um, now that we've deployed the transform, we see it actually gets written to a topic in here. And so kind of here is the binary 
uh, format of that. If, if again, anyone wants to, to read that, you're welcome to. But now we should be ready. Now that's deployed, um, we'll be able to write some data, hopefully find the space station, write it into that topic, and then consume it back out again. Uh, OK, so let's get a reading on the space station, which requires me to have data. Yes, I do. Um, anyone know where that is? I don't know where 42, 170 is. Um, I'll set up a consumer to consume from the Avro topic over this side. And what I'm going to do is just produce onto the JSON topic on the other side. So I'm going to get this, this little bit of JSON here, copy that, and then paste that into there. And then when I press return on the other side, we've now got our, our Avro coming out the other side. And you can kind of see here our first five bytes is the zero and then our schema ID, and then the rest of it is my Avro that hopefully corresponds to this. And if I go to back to Red Panda console, the JSON is this one here. So this is what the JSON looks like. I'll make that a bit bigger. And you kind of see 113 bytes just to, to encode the, the lap, the long, and the, and the timestamp. And then if we go back and look at the Avro topic, uh, there we have the Avro, 26 bytes all in. Um, it's, it's none of the, you know, the, the, you don't have to store the, the, the field names. That's all done as part of the schema. And so there we go, one record in, one record out. And if we wanted to track him uh, perhaps a bit more in real time, we can do that. If there's any data in here, which there may or may not be. Oh, no, I'm putting that into a file. Let me do that differently. And you kind of see, as we're writing each record, um, certainly as quick as I can see it, it's coming across on the other side. We're writing that out as Avro. If we go into Red Panda Console, uh, refresh that, we can see the data coming in as we track Major Tim Speak as he isn't on the space station. But if he were, we'd be seeing him going across the sky. So that's what we've built. And of course, we can make that more complicated. And then as we then decide we want to actually work out all the other bits of telemetry of the space station, we can change this bit out, write it in, and then evolve the schema as we go. And that, that's kind of the benefits of you doing this with Avro and of doing these stateless transforms in Red Panda. So what can we take home? Simple transformations in Kafka can actually be really difficult and add a load of complexity to your environment and just give you an operational nightmare. Uh, with Red Panda, we can use WebAssembly to simplify these. Um, we can use this for enrichment, or for filtering, or routing, or conversions, or validations. Um, pretty much anything you want to do, you can do that now as part of these stateless data transforms. WebAssembly, amazing. Um, the future of serverless, in my opinion. Um, but it means that you can use any language to compile this to run in, uh, in Red Panda. Um, and if you've not heard of Red Panda, simple, powerful, reliable, uh, and most certainly cost effective to use. Thank you very much. We're over at booth 757, which is over there somewhere. If you want to come and, uh, come and chat afterwards, more than happy to talk about anything you want to know. Thank you very much.